Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am Alta's digital editor and I am thrilled to welcome you all to today's conversation on the inc this incredible community of indigenous artists who were working together in Oklahoma in the 1960s and 70s. Jason Asnap, who is a contributor to Alta Journal, wrote about this community, including uh, a relatively recent discovery of some of the memorabilia and artwork from that era in his latest for Ulta. His connection to the subject runs deep. His father, who also joins us today, Hollis Asnap, um, was a participant in this community. He is still a working artist and um, we're so excited to have them both join us here today. Jason is a Comanche and Muscogee Creek writer, critic, and filmmaker. He's based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hollis Grayfoot Asnap is a Comanche artist. He divides his time between Anadarko, Oklahoma, and Grand Prairie, Texas. Um, they're both so humble. They have the shortest bios I've ever had. Of they're <laughs> both of these men, these gentlemen, are incredibly accomplished, and I will will include an email at the end of this to all of you um, with links to their work where you can read more of Jason's work, learn more about Hollis. Um, but before we dive into our conversation, if you are, have never heard of us, Alta Journal is a quarterly magazine. It's a big, beautiful quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. You can sub support us and subscribe to Alta for $50 a month. You can join as a digital member for $3 a month. Um, or come to free events like this. We host a monthly California book club. Next week, we're welcoming Dave Eggers as our guest. We have live events issue parties in generally the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles Bay Area. I am being pointed out, my boss is pointing out, it's $50 a year, not a month. It's only $50 a year to join Ulta. So please do that. You get a hat, you get a book, and you get four gorgeous issues of Ulta. Um, this interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later this afternoon, hopefully. Again, we're also going to send you an email with any pertinent links that come up um, about Jason Hollis, this incredible time. And of course, um, we want to kind of send you to Jason's article in Alta, which is just fantastic and is right here. Um, so there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please ask your questions. We're also going to look at some artwork. Um, so I'm, I've got a slideshow of some artists that Jason writes about in his article that Hollis knew and worked with um, in his work as an artist in Anadarko. It is so great to be here with our community today. Um, please let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. I am in Northern California. Um, here in Nevada, California. Jason, where are you today? Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Hollis, where are you zooming in from? Annie Darko, Oklahoma. Annie Darko, Oklahoma. I like saying that. Sounds like Annie <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, hi, San Rafael, LA, South City, Sacramento. It is so nice to Washington, DC. It's great to see this group joining us today. Um, Phoenix, Jason, if I could, oh, Fitz Creek, Alaska, Santa Barbara. Okay, we've got a great group. Thank you all so much. Um, Jason. Hey, that's my sister. Hey. Who's your sister? Uh, Francine. Francine She's in Oklahoma yeah. City. Hi, Francine. <laughs> um, Jason, can you tell us the the, the beginning of your, your story, um, your feature in Alta, is about this unearthed collection of Polaroids. Can you tell us just about McKee's store, these Polaroids that were discovered um, and how they kind of opened up your interest in this era of Indian art from Oklahoma in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, so so my friend Scott Hale, <clears throat> my uh, good friend, um, he texted me the image of these photos and was just like, hey, one of these, you 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 look like Black Bear Bosu. This is great, this is eerie, you know, because he has glasses or whatever. And, and I looked at the photos and I was just like, um, it's got, you know, Rance Hood when he looks like a teenager and like um, Black Bear Boson. It's got all, um, uh, Doc Tate, uh, Nebuquoia, would, would you watch you take her? It's like all these incredible artists that um, that I, some of which I grew up around who are my uncles. Uh, yeah, there they are. And I've uh, been a big uh, fan of their art of, as well. And so it just kind of like, you know, it kind of sparked this, you know, just interest in like, finding out more about this whole topic of like, um, and I, this this has been part of my childhood. This is like, looking at those photos takes me back to when I was a kid 
uh, when all, a lot of these artists were at my dad's house and they're all hanging out, hanging out, listening to Santana and Steely Dan records, I'm drawing, you know, just drawing and they're just talking and, you know, you know, having a good time. And so, yeah, I just wanted to know more. And so then I talked to um, Leslie Half Moon, who told she's the one that found the photos and found out kind of the backstory. And Leslie's a friend of mine, too. I didn't even know that she was the one that found the photos. And she told me that um, the Caddo Nation had bought McKee's, which is this great um, store in, in Anadarko. And they resurrected this store that was was once really a great place for, for Indian art and Indian art supplies. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically the backstory, the genesis of this, the catalyst of this story, you know, the beginning. When you say that some of these people featured in these Polaroids were your uncles, I mean, you mean like just your dad's close friends, you know, in your house, like. Yeah, I mean, Rance actually told me he was his uncle. So, or I was his uncle, you know, he's like, you're, you know. So it's like, I view Rance as like actually my uncle because he was around a lot. And like, you know, he, him and my dad are, are, are good friends. So, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was close to a lot of these men, uh, Rance in particular, like for sure. So it, so it seems like, it, and when, I hope that if you haven't read it yet, you do read Portrait of the Artists, Jason's article in Alta, that in the 1960s and 70s, in this very small community of about 5,000, 6,000 people in Anadarko, Oklahoma, there was a really vibrant, thriving community of artists, native artists, um, creating work and working together, encouraging each other. Hollis, can you, you were a part of that community. Can you tell us a little bit about how it came together or how you came to, to kind of discover this group of colleagues and friends? Well, they, in my hometown, Walters, there was another one, Black Moon, which was not in here, but he was a, a Comanche artist. And they were all different though. Rance was probably the craziest. <laughs> wildest but uh, we had a good time together um, he liked to ride horses with me he would come and stay a week sometimes two weeks until I told him it's time to get you a home <laughs> and I run him off but he uh, he enjoyed being around us and riding horses and uh, helped him uh, draw and paint and uh, Doc Tate lived behind me and Norman and he was always coming over and, and we'd go out and we'd go to his house and just uh we did everything together, and uh, Woodie, he came over too, and uh, they were all painting. They were all mostly self-taught, and uh, I was always preaching to them about you know um, using better paint and better brushes because they were doing okay. But I thought they just had better equipment; it would be really a jump in their in their artwork. So I, I preached to them, and I gave up, and just, I just bought them a whole set. I bought them all the whole set. Went to Newton brushes and uh it came to a point and uh and uh watercolors that dried flat because they were trying to uh, paint flat and so uh their work jumped overnight but rance i think was more, uh, more talented than anybody he had uh he conquered acrylic watercolors and he had a great imagination and for those that aren't familiar with the the names of these artists. Some of them, many of them have gone on to, their work is collected, treasured, um, right. incredibly valuable these Rance's days. work was probably the highest, you know, these, these self-taught artists. I didn't know Black Bear Bolson very much. Um, he was, uh, I was never around him though, but I liked his work and I've seen a lot of it in Edarko. What was McKee's? I mean, did everyone just hang out at McKee's buying art supplies? What was that? Why well, was that the centerpiece of this? I don't know. Was it part pawn shop? But he had uh, stuff there like a championship war uh, a buckle war dance buckle that I wanted, but I couldn't <laughs> afford it. <laughs> and he had paintings there, and he had uh, real stuff like pipes, pipe stems. Uh, he just had good stuff, and uh, I used to go in there and just. Uh, look around when I was a kid and I couldn't buy anything, but I thought one of these days when I grow up, I could buy stuff there. Um, that's a, and so so that's kind of the, the community and then in the 60s and 70s kind of came together. Why did you all happen to be in Annie Darko, Oklahoma? Is there some kind of well, art school? Uh, Black Moon was in uh, Walters, Oklahoma. And uh, Woody was in uh, uh, north of Lawton, Oklahoma. But we all hung out. We hung out in the powwows, and 
POD meetings and um, mostly just any kind of Indian activities. We were around there and they were selling art. There was no, it was tough for them. They didn't have like a Cowboy Hall of Fame. And I'm still waiting for that because uh, the Cowboy Hall, Hall of Fame helped the Cowboy artists a lot. And we never got that. I was hoping the National Museum of American India would help out, but they haven't shown much interest in that either. So it's not stabilized. So if, if you bought Rance Hood's painting, you paid a lot of money for it. You kind of just stuck with it because uh, they don't have the help like the Cowboy Hall of Fame, which we need. Okay. <laughs> I think she might have froze up. <laughs> 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 you shocked her. <laughs> you fell off. <laughs> well, that's interesting about uh, Cowboy Hall of, like the, the lack of support from Cowboy Hall of Fame. I think that might be changing a little bit now, but yeah, I, I, I don't see a lot of like those uh, Reds Hood being supported, Doc T kind of, no. the Southern Plains artists seems to not be, uh, not as supported. And that makes it tough when you don't have a, somebody like, you know, to hold it steady where you can, the whole its value of the painting, mm -hmm. just on your own. And uh, I was hoping the Cowboy Hall of Fame or the National Museum of American Indian could help out, or the Comanche Museum. But nobody, none of them get it, you know, that this, that they, we need this, you mm -hmm. know, stability, you know, to get our prices up and stay up. Why do you think that the that style of from that area is overlooked? Well, it's always changing. I think one of the best uh, best artists that did that was um, that Apache artist. Um, can't think of his name right now. He was from this area and went to school in Santa Fe and taught, taught in Santa Fe. You're talking about Alan Hauser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at one point, uh, somebody said, this is why Indian art should look like flat, you know, because we're doing hives and teepees. So mm -hmm. when you put it on board, they said, this is how Indian art should look like. Well, that was invented in Santa Fe. And then it was a good platform, but it made you uh, work hard to design because you had to print flat. And mm -hmm. then you had to uh, actually go further so you have your own style. Mm -hmm. So Alan Hauser painted great. Then he got into sculpture, all kinds of stuff. And modern art and paintings, you know, changed. So... Mm -hmm. It's a good stepping stone, but you know you should respect the transition from Indian art to sculpture and changing it. Because if it's a lot of times when the people wouldn't buy Indian art, if you did pastel, that that's, that's not Indian art. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it took a while for them to get adjusted to other other ways of painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. You said you uh, you had met Alan Hauser one uh, before. Yeah, I went to Santa Fe when I was teaching for the Indian school. Uh huh. And I spent the whole day with him, just talking, and we just visit. I just stayed with him all day at Santa Fe. Huh. That was a great, uh, you know, I liked being there talking to him about Indian art and his artwork and what he had been through and from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. New Mexico. It, it was a great, uh, I'll never forget it. Um, Hi guys, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, I was going to ask you to talk to you. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, you guys are doing great on your own. Let me t t tell you. Um, I'm John Gecki. For those who don't know me, I'm the creative director for Alta. I just wanted to let you know that uh, Beth has lost power. We've had a storm come through the Bay Area. Okay. Um, so you guys are doing just great talking on your own. I'll let you guys talk for a few more minutes if you could, and then I'll break back in it towards the end here and, and see if we have any audience questions. Okay. Okay. Well, it looks like was this Cat Clark asks, can you share more about challenges facing the artist community today? Well, uh, take the Comanche uh, Museum. They only buy Indian, Comanche Indian art. And there's um, paintings available that were that you couldn't touch. I mean, they weren't all like a, a different tribes in Oklahoma. If you, uh, the Comanche tribe won't buy anything unless they're Comanche and they're passing up on great artwork because they're not Comanche. So they'll mm. buy something that's Comanche that's not very good and pass up on a great artist. And I thought that was uh, crazy how they did that. Hmm. 
Yeah. You don't see Ranch Hood uh, at the Comanche Museum, you know. I guess they're waiting for him to die, but they should honor him while he's alive. Oh, I totally agree. I agree with that. Um, hi there. I'm back. I'm so sorry. I lost power. <laughs> there you are, Beth. I don't know if you've heard that we had storms in California. I just lost power. Our generator just ramped up. Before I disappear again, why don't I share some artwork so that we can talk about that kind of as we're talking, um, if that works for everyone here. Um, stand by. Um, share screen. Um, again, I so apologize. Can everyone hear me now in the chat? Yeah. I should turn this back on. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, and John, can you please make me a host? Um, all right, here, let me dive in with some more questions while I figure this out. I'm so sorry, guys. It's been the week of the month of technical difficulties here at Alta Online. Um, Jason, you kind of selected several artists, Rance Hood, Doc Tate, Woogie, Woogie, I don't know how to pronounce that, and Woogie. Archie, Woogie, and Archie Woogie. Black Owl as kind of examples of work that, you know, we might want to consider when talking about this this group. Why, how did you select those artists? Why those artists? Well, Rance, for, for obvious reasons, if you look at his paintings and he's, he's just so, his, 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 uh, his colors and his, uh, his style and his, they're just, there's beautiful paintings. Uh, I love his paintings. He's just, they're brilliant. I, I, I think. And then, uh, of course, Doc and, and Woogie, I'm, I'm close to those two as well. And I love their paintings and their art. And I grew up with them and I highly respect them. And then uh, Archie Blackout, I know my dad's a big fan of Archie's. So, and he has a few of his uh, paintings recently. So, and they're hanging up at the house. So yeah, that's that's basically why I picked those four. Is there, are there kind of themes in this era, either like visually, um, inter, you know, stylistic themes that, that tended to emerge from oh. this era in Oklahoma native art? I'll let dad speak to that. Hollis. Well, they were all different. I mean, we um, um, a Black Moon. I go back to him. He was real conservative, and he printed. He painted real light, in soft colors. Rance did, and his stuff was real bright, and he had a lot of action. And his um, and Woogie, he was different too. Uh, he was kind of well. He was a good artist. But they were just totally different. And, and Doc Tate, he tried to be a traditional artist. And uh, this is what you right. right. looks like. What you watch, you take her right there. Yeah. Watch you take her there. Yeah. They were all good. And they were trying to. This is Doc Tate. Doc Tate, yeah. They were showing the way of life, the, the way Comanches lived free and followed the buffalo. <laughs> they had a beautiful life. Was and, it all specifically Comanche? Uh, those. Those were all Comanche except uh, Archie Blackout. But uh, that one, that's a beautiful painting. He did he did that uh, several different colors. This but is Archie just, Blackout. And when, you, and when uh, I was in Oklahoma history class, and we had one page in the Oklahoma history book. And I asked about that. How come we get one page? And she said, write your own book. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I started drawing and painting because. Oh, wow. And she ta taught me a lesson, you know, write your own book. I said, you're right. Well, yeah. When you were, I mean, forgive me if you covered this while I was struggling with the universe. Um, When you were kind of working together in this era, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, when young Jason was sitting there scribbling and the rest of these art, these uncles were kind of in the background. Did you actively share your artwork were there shows where were you at mckee's kind of sharing artwork um and discussing it i was always working but they, they made their living painting they had a duct tape that's all he did and woogie he was in a in a dance world and he made his living doing indian art either dancing singing going to powwows but he just lived it that was his job and uh Doc was just a painter. I mean, that, that's all he did. And uh, Rance, uh, he, he painted. He was self-taught. And it's rough because uh, there, was, there, there wasn't there was very many Indian art galleries in Oklahoma. 
if you wanted to sell Indian art, a lot of times you had to go to New Mexico, Santa Fe, Albuquerque. And then they would, Oklahoma's would go out there, open the people and buy it and bring it back to Oklahoma. But there was no galleries in Oklahoma. Why do you think that that was? If there was a market for it in Oklahoma where people are traveling out of state to get this artwork, why has Oklahoma not celebrated, or at the time at least, these artists and their work? I don't think they appreciate it. They just didn't take it seriously. Uh, but, and the, and the artists were trying to hang on to everything they could, the Indian artists. Or, if you see people dancing, you don't think too much of it, but that's it. we didn't have a written language. You couldn't write it down. So everything was passed down by songs and dances and powwows. So it was, a lot of our history was a, was passed down like that and paintings was part of it sure. and uh, so people say well why do they always have to dance well they love it but they're also teaching and keeping the language alive and the music so and dance so all of that was important and when people were looking down they said why do they have to do that well keeping the the uh, keeping our language alive our songs and those down and in our experiences living on the plains before the white man got here. My grandmother was born on the plains and surrendered in the, with the Comanche tribe with Corner Parker. She was my first babysitter only, and she only spoke Comanche. So she was telling me stories when I was about four and five about surrendering with the Comanche tribe and being scared that they were gonna get killed because mm -hmm. uh, we didn't take prisoners because we lived on horseback. And so she would tell me stories in Comanche, and that, I just kept those in my mind. But I was probably about four years old, maybe five before kindergarten. And she told me a story about Lupitz and Nunapis. Lupitz was a Bigfoot. Nunapi was little people. And so I thought she was crazy. <laughs> she was talking about big hairy man. I said, what is Lupitz, the big hairy man? I think that 20 years later, I finally found out it was a Bigfoot. <laughs> The Comanches killed it. What? Wait, the Comanches killed Bigfoot? Yeah, because he was taking the women. <laughs> and probably this is a whole other... Jason, there is your next article, by the way. If we could just... <laughs> um, the Comanches killed Bigfoot because he was taken... Until so your grandma is telling you these stories right. in Comanche, and you're a little kid. Right. Do so you still I, speak Comanche? I did speak Comanche. That's all she spoke was Comanche. Uh, I spoke it until I got to kindergarten, and uh, oh. they said, "No, you can't. You can't speak Comanche. You got to speak English." And so I didn't say anything. Then I was thirsty, and I said, "Oh, what? Oh, you can't speak Spanish either." <laughs> so I went home and told my dad, "They won't let me talk." He said, "Well, you're better off if you just speak English." <laughs> so I lost my language. Oh God, I'm sorry, Jason. You don't speak Comanche? Just the bad words. Sure, of course. Um, Jason, you said in your article that you you feel that your father is one of the last of a generation still of artists still working. Why do you think that is? If if so much of this was about passing down the tradition and the culture to the next generation. Well, I, I, I he's the, I would say he's the last of his generation. Okay. Um, I'll be I would specify that, and then probably. Yeah, maybe, maybe working primarily in this style. And <clears throat> yeah, there's- This is Hollis's work, by the way. Yeah. So dad, you know, can explain his work far better than I can, but just my observations are just like, he's he's he's, tr he's traditional, he's, or I don't like that word either, but he's interested in, you know, you could say cultural preservation and and, and painting things uh, the right way, the way that, uh, and he's very, uh, he seems to be very interested in the accuracy of things. I mean, he was teaching me he just uh just over the previous years about how like uh the just a cowboy hat, how like the dent of a cowboy hat, depending on where it's at, means so many different things. You could be a, you know, it, it, as far as like um as far as cowboy culture goes. And then uh the the evolution of regalia, like powwow uh clothing, powwow clothes, regalia, how that changes through the years and how certain styles and bustles get bigger and smaller and just things I don't think about necessarily because I'm, you know, I'm not an artist in the same way that he is because he's more, uh, he's, he's, he's interested in those things and I'm doing other things. So, but I always love to talk to him and learn about those things, you know? 
Tell us what inspires, what are, what are you trying to express with your work? I don't want to exaggerate because right now I'm painting dancers and I want to, when you look at it, that's the way they really look to me. I'm not putting extra dots or feathers or anything to jazz it up. This is how they were actually looked in that day. And so there's a, if you're in the powwow and you're trying to win the championship, you've got to uh, follow the powwow fashion. And so the bustle on the, on the back might be straight up and straight out. That's the new look. But if, if you're not following powwow fashion, you're not going to win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a powwow fashion that goes along with this. But it, it started a long time ago when we used to use quills and beadwork. And we used to use... Uh, just hides and stuff, you know, to and feathers. And so it it grew into what it is today. And so you can look, if it's one bustle, it's probably up, up northern, maybe the crow. If it's two, it's probably southern. And there's just a, they're close with it. There's, everybody's got their own look and that's what makes it so great. And I want to paint it to capture that look. And if I could capture the dance, I want to, I don't want it to stand there. I want them dancing when I draw and paint. And I'm I'm trying to study the the songs and the dances too. Uh, the crows got the crow hop. If you were went to a a stomp dance, they got the friendship dance or a stomp dance. And Comanches have their own dances, scout dance and buffalo dance. So they all had their own dances too and their own songs. And they're trying to preserve that song and dance. And it's just a way of life that they want to celebrate. And uh, even though it's it's today, you know, it's, uh, they're still looking back that, hey, these were great days and this is how we were great horsemen. And there was a lot of food and everybody was, uh, was you know, loved to live on the plains. They just had a good time. And so, um, and our tribes got whittled down to like Comanches. We were down to about a thousand people at one time and made a comeback. And so we lost a lot of songs and tradition that we can't even, mm -hmm. Can't remember how, how we did them, but in Oklahoma, you got all all kinds of stuff from peyote meetings to stickball games to powwows to uh, gourd dancing, hand games. There's just a a whole bunch of things in Oklahoma that that you can't find in Texas or Kansas or New Mexico. It's just an interesting state to be around if you were in Indian, if you were in looking at artwork and dances and peyote meetings it's it's all here in Oklahoma it seems like there's a lot of connection and intersection with the arts and culture you're not just a painter of native <laughs> art you're involved in dance and music and song right. um, is that that seems I mean I don't know I'm not an artist but is that kind of specific to this community or specific to to native well, art I call it like the uh the plains all the way from the Crow, the Cheyennes up north coming down. And uh, I'm in the Darko, there's a lot of Kiowas here. And there's about five different tribes here in, in, in the Darko. And so they all had their own customs and and uh, their own look and the way they dress. And, and uh, the Kiowas are real proud. And they have about 10,000 10, members. We have about 20,000. The Creeks have 100,000 in Oklahoma, in my wife's Creek. And so they're they're all different, and they all have different dances, different songs. Even the way they're buried, my wife, if she wants to be buried, she wants a little house over her grave. We don't do that, but that's what she wants. <laughs> oh, interesting. Jason, what did you learn in, in, I mean, I realize that you've grown up around your dad and his community. Um, but in terms of the kind of discovery of these Polaroids and examining this era in Oklahoma art, what did you kind of discover about your heritage and your dad? You know, I, honestly, it's it's a story I've been sitting on for a while. So I wouldn't even say it's just a story I've been waiting to share more, more than anything and just looking for the right venue, whether it be a documentary and it still could be a documentary. But it's a story I've been sitting on for a while. It's it's not there's nothing new in that story that I haven't <clears throat> known about for a long time. But I'm mostly just happy to share it with you know with the the alter reader alter readers 
and um and and just share my dad's uh my dad's artwork and his experiences i think it's a really special time uh in indian art in oklahoma indian art and i'm glad to share it with the with the readers are there any we're getting a couple of questions from the audience are there any museums um, I guess anywhere in the country, there's some suggestions about the Southwest Museum in Los Angeles, California, the Autry Museum in Southern California, that carry any of these artists. If we if we wanted to go see um, outside of Oklahoma, any of these artists, are they in museums or galleries? The Comanche says a museum, but I don't, if you go in a museum, you don't see the paintings of Rant Hood or Dot Tape. They have them in storage. Why? I don't know, you know, uh, they have one of my paintings, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure what they have, but um, no, there's not really a place, even the Capitol Hall of Fame, they have a Silverman collection, that's the best in an art collection in Oklahoma, but they never show the whole collection, they have a little room, they just show parts of it, so you never get the feeling that this is a great in an art show, you know, that, that nobody's done that yet. Mm. I was thinking, Maybe talking to the National Museum of American Indian, it's a bigger building showing the whole collection of Arthur Silverman. He had everything you know, from uh, Northwest uh, Oklahoma artists to uh, New Mexico artists, pottery, rugs, uh, just everything you think of in painting. And he's got, he had the greatest Indian art collection in his home, but he didn't want to tell anybody because he's afraid he's going to get robbed. <laughs> and I helped him with the murals. They were tearing down the, the post offices and schools. And I would help him and tell him, you know, you go, we need to go over here to save this mural. They would tear it off the wall and he would put it back together and make a, made a beautiful painting that was going to be destroyed. Wow. So the, he has a great collection. It just seems like, like ripe for a major exhibit. I mean, especially. I feel like this article alone, you could do an Oklahoma artists of the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. This era is so incredible, so beautiful. And I know, I mean, I, I forgive me for, you know, assuming or guessing, but there was so much um, activism around Native American rights, indigenous rights of that era. Did any of that inspire or kind of motivate this artwork, that kind of community? Well, they... Uh... I talked to a gallery in Norman, and uh, she was selling stuff from overseas and paintings and stuff. And I said, you're surrounded by artwork in Oklahoma. Everything from paintings to feather work to uh, pottery, just civil work, everything. And, I, and she opened her eyes up and said, you're right. And so Norman had one of the first uh, Indian art galleries around, and then she did real well. But uh, that was just one, though. <laughs> um, last question before you before we wrap it up, and I hope that my computer doesn't crash again. Let me just get quit while I'm ahead. Um, how do you? I, I think this is a question for both of you. But in terms of non-indigenous, non-native people buying this artwork, collecting this artwork, um, are how do how does how do you feel about that? That's fine. I mean, the uh, artists need somebody to buy their artwork. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of galleries around to actually sell it. Um, and, and, you know, they have to move around because they get saturated so quick, they can move to another town so they can sell it. So the, the appreciation of this, I guess, or the collecting of what seems to be, a you know, a... a, a curation of your culture, uh, uh, maintaining of, you know, your culture is is fine with you. I, I ask only because, you know, you I've read certainly articles of, you know, certain kinds of artwork should only be collected by certain people. If this is your culture, why should it be hanging in my house? That's um, fine. You're, that's great. <laughs> artists need to make, have money coming in. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like, I don't think... I'm artist is going to, you know, ever going to complain about being able to feed their family or, you know, have a roof over their head and by creating art, you know, by creating, via creating art. I think that that, yeah, I, I get what, I get what that argument might be, but I think that 
a working artist definitely needs to make money, you know. I'm a little bit different. I I study in an art, and but I've worked in the commercial art of it. I am the Dallas Cowboys hired me to print their put their print shop together. So I was the um, when they bought their way the NF when they got out of the NFL, like I was doing their game day shirts and um, arena football shirts, and they came to me and just cornered me and said, "We want you to do it. Name your price and you start the." Uh, Dallas Cowboys print shops because they already had stores, but they need somebody to print for them. And so they went all over the world and bought t bought the shirts. And so we did all the printing. And uh, we started out in Dallas and ended up in Prosper. But we we kept growing and growing. We uh, out, outgrowing the buildings, so they built us a bigger building in Prosper. So I I spent almost twenty years with the Cowboys, and, and I would quit and leave, and they'd call me back. But see, I wasn't doing Indian art. I wasn't doing artwork. I was doing production. And so I was in charge of the, I was the first operation manager for the Dallas Cowboys to do, put their print shop together. Wow. And so I, they said, what do you need? And I said, to start, I need a million dollars worth of equipment, 50 people, 30,000 square foot, season tickets, insurance, <laughs> and a good salary. And they, and they gave it all to me. It's wow. a WIC registered by Jerry Jones. So I, I've been living in two different worlds, but I didn't depend on art or Indian art to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I never really went to art school either. Never got a chance to go to art school. I was wanting to go to Pasadena to the art center. And I was teaching in, in the Indian school. And they said, well, your portfolio pass, if you just got to see in art history, we'll admit you to the art center in Pasadena. That was my goal. So I, went, I, I quit teaching and I went to Northeastern to get the uh, see in art history. But when I was there, I realized I don't want to go to California. <laughs> I want to stay here in Oklahoma. And so I didn't go to the art center. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, You, Jason, I can see why it's fun to tell your father's story and why you've wanted to. And, and I hope that you continue to. Thank you both so much for joining us. And for vamping, I don't know what you talked about while I disappeared and tried to get my electricity to work, but I hope it was great. Um. <laughs> And, and thank you to everyone joining us. Please come next week. We will be talking about the Oregonian secession movement. Should part of Oregon become part of Idaho? Um, and we'll we'll speak with our guest about that, who is who's leading the charge um, to separate part of Oregon into Idaho. In the meantime, this has been recorded. It will be emailed to you. Thank you so much, Jason Asnap, Hollis Grayfoot Asnap. Thank you both so much for joining us, for your patience with me and for sharing such beautiful artwork and stories with our audience. We're very grateful. I'd like to show you my artwork sometime. Yeah. Send us your artwork. We'll add it to this. We'll put it online. Love to see it. Well, it's in the car in the briefcase right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it belongs. I, we would love to see it. Should get it out of the car and out of the briefcase. Right now? You may go get it. Yes, I want you to go get it. If you want to stay, folks, come hang out. We're going to see Hollis's artwork. Okay. <laughs> Jason, I love having your dad here. I figure if my electricity goes out, we can have your dad come go to his car and get his artwork, show it to us. I didn't know. What's he doing carrying his art in his trunk? I don't understand. What Jason didn't know that his father knew how to Zoom until <laughs> we asked um, him to join us and he kind of happily discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know he could zoom. I was like, he's like, oh, I zoom every week with Howard like, Trump. I didn't know that. So does he still dance? Is he still participating in powwows and dances? Oh, he's no, he's just a painter, strictly a painter, you know. Here he's back. Yeah. These are some of the t shirts that I've done recently. I don't know if you can see them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is your work, like screen printed on a t shirt? Yes. Beautiful. Where are you selling this? This one is going to uh, the Herd Museum in Phoenix. They wanted some t-shirts. To... I don't know if you can see closer. this. One. Yeah, get a little closer, Dan. Can you come closer? You can't um, see this one. Yeah, that one we can't see. But are you sell you're selling these to museums? Well, or... I've got in a Smithsonian. I got an order from them this week. Oh, really? The Smithsonian. Wow. 
stomp dance. You can't see this too well on screen, though. Zoom oh, you put it on your Put it on your chest. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, there we go. Oh, here. Those look like stomp dancers. Yeah, stomp dancers. Oh, that's beautiful. And I love the, like, border also. It's beaded looking. Yeah. Can can we buy any of these online? Like, let's plug your wares. Where can? Well, we sell to the casinos. I'm, I'm trying to sell to the Smithsonian. They just made an order, and then you can't see it, but this looks like beadwork. Yeah, yeah we can see it. Beautiful. I I sold this a long time ago. Then I decided I wanted to put it on the shirt. Gorgeous. Hmm. I'm gonna run out and get a painting. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I, I feel like if I may speak for everyone, we are all in love with Hollis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the sweetest dad. Um, did you know he was doing all of this, Jason? The t-shirts? I never know. <laughs> This is so cool. What a what a resource. What a like a a well of enthusiasm and knowledge. He's, he's so very, chill about it all, but he's busy. He's very spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> this is unexpected. Folks that are staying with us. Oh, you are all having fun. Fantastic. <laughs> um, this is great. Yeah. So he's gonna show us artwork now. Is he running out to his car really? I, I guess so. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Annie Daka, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um thanks well if we can find out where hollis asnap is selling any of his artwork what a perfect dessert um i will find a link to it and and share it with the audience because i know i would certainly love to support this um <laughs> as well as our yeah the oral tradition so J look, jason let me ask you in in terms of the i i the phrase cultural appropriation is is popping up. We Jason previously wrote about um kind of land art and that the article was the hubris of land art, like this kind of notion that of these modern artists doing, you know, creating big art pieces on land that is stolen. Um how do you feel as as not I realize that you're an artist in your own venues, but how do you feel about uh people who aren't native collecting artwork like this. I, I say uh, buy it because the artists need to uh, eat. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is beautiful. Oh, hold it closer to your chest. When you pretend to be sure it works. There we go. Oh, wow. Hollis. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. That's Woody. Oh, these colors are just incredible, beautiful. You have to speak and it'll go, the camera will go to you, Dad. Oh, we didn't see that one, Dad. We didn't see that one. It's a better one. Okay. She likes this one better anyway. Oh, wow. Who's that, Dad? Dad, who's that? Who's this, Hollis? Can you see it? Yeah, but who who is it? You know, I don't know who this is. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot of photographs at powwows. And oh. oh, is that how you do it? You take photos at powwows and then work from the photos? Yeah, because I can't remember everything. Well, well who can? <laughs> so I used all, all the help I can get. Yeah. Um, you it's are. 2024. It's 2024. <laughs> Hollis, do you mind my asking, how old are you? I'm uh, 76. Um, almost eighty. Not <laughs> almost eighty. You um, you're really inspiring and fun to listen to, and I um, I am inspired by your passion and enthusiasm for this and all of your work. So thank you so much for for sharing so much of yourself and your work with us, and of course your wonderful son whose work appears in Ulta. Yeah. Okay.
Thank Thanks. you both. Thank Ace you. Naps. Um, folks, that was really fun um, and spontaneous. Thank you, which is what I like to think makes Alt Alive a kick. Um, thank you all for joining us so much. Thank you again to Jason and Hollis. And um, we will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.